My name is Sam Pigeon. I'm the Vice President of the Queensland Teachers Union. <laughs> I'm one of your three co-chairs for this evening. Welcome to the founding of the Queensland Community Alliance. As we start, we acknowledge that we are meeting on Aboriginal land. I would like to introduce Shannon Rusker, a traditional owner from the Yuggera people, for the welcome to country. How is everyone tonight? In great spirit. My name is Shannon Rusker and I descend on my father's side as an Aboriginal uh, from, from the uh, different clans from around South East Queensland area. On my mother's side as non-Aboriginal. On that side we have the Scottish, Irish, German and just with... I'm a bit of Australian, bits of this and bits of that but here I am. Uh, many stories to tell and from many different backgrounds as well and many different beliefs. But uh, here we are on the, on the country of the, the, the Torbu clan of the Yagara language speakers. Our old grandfather, old Kerwali King Sandy, was actually one that occupied the particular area here uh, when the Petrie family came along and made good friends with the Petrie family. And uh, his daughter, Sarah Morton, married over to the Stradbroke Island area, married Billy Morton, and, and, uh, and then had all the kids, kids galore. And, and uh, we end up back over from Stratty here to Brisbane. But um, on behalf of my people, I'd like to welcome you. But going back to talking about beliefs and belief system, I think that uh, it doesn't matter which way you try to get there, up there. It doesn't matter what religion you follow, and it doesn't matter what culture you come from, because we're all on that same journey. We're all on the journey to get up to that fella up above. And that we call Bayami here. And Bayami means God. But ladies and gentlemen, you uh, have the freedom to be able to speak about what you want. You have the freedom to be who you are. And so, be it. And on behalf of our people, we say, Yura Yura, hello all. You're not going to read You gather on our land. May God and our ancestors guide you in peace on the country of the footsteps of our ancestors. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. We accept your welcome with gratitude and we match it with our commitment to work with the First Nations for justice and reconciliation. I acknowledge, hey, we can fix it tonight. I acknowledge the elders and traditional custodians on behalf of all the subsequent speakers who will participate in tonight's event. Good evening. My name's Reverend David Baker. I'm moderator of the Uniting Church in Australia, Queensland Synod. I'm your second co-chair. I'm excited to be here. This is where the church belongs. Standing for justice in the public square united with others who share our values and our commitments. Amen. Hello, I'm Karen Benson, the CEO of Multicultural Development Australia. I'm your third co-chair. <laughs> I'm your third co-chair for tonight's assembly. Tonight is a historic moment for the Queensland Community Alliance. It is the culmination of more than three years' work in the communities of Logan, Ipswich and North Brisbane. There are diverse organisations represented here tonight, including unions, faith groups and not-for-profits like my own MDA. I would now like to invite Archbishop Mark Coldridge, the Catholic Archbishop of Brisbane, to offer an opening blessing. Please make him welcome. That's my rowdy mob over there. <laughs> the joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the people of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys and hopes, the griefs 
and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Now these aren't my words, they're key words of the Second Vatican Council, which 50 years ago set the agenda for the Catholic Church at least into the third millennium. The words explain why the Catholic Church in this part of the world is part of this community alliance. And it's also why I'm here tonight. I'm very happy to be here. All the followers of Jesus Christ are called to be moved by whatever is truly human. And we're called to work for the common good with everyone who shares the same values, if not the same faith. And the issues that you've chosen to focus upon, care and employment, are key priorities for the church in Australia. They've also been the focus of the social justice statements by the Catholic bishops of Australia last year and this year. So I can assure you that the church to which I belong and which I try to lead is seriously committed to doing whatever we can on these issues and others and doing it with anyone who wants to join us in the task and we'll join you. I've been asked to give a blessing this evening, so let's just take a moment now to centre ourselves after the rush of the day, to centre ourselves in silence for just a moment. We ask you, God of peace and justice, to bless this assembly and to bless this community alliance that is born this evening. Open our hearts and our minds to each other to our shared humanity. Strengthen our commitment to relationships and to action. Give us wisdom, give us courage to work for true change in the world that is both yours and ours. All of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop. The Queensland Community Alliance is about disorganised civil society getting organised and getting disciplined. Part of our discipline is that we are strictly non-partisan and we will keep our engagement with politicians appropriately so tonight. Another is time discipline. You may have noticed that we started exactly on time and we're also going to finish exactly on time. And our timekeepers down the front here will keep us to this task. And we're going to need uh, to be kept to task tonight because we have some important goals. Three goals tonight. The first is to found our alliance. This is the night where we go public and commit our organisations to stand together as an alliance, prepared to claim our space in the public sphere and to work for the common good. The second is to gain public recognition from our decision makers. The Queensland Premier, who's with us here tonight. Thank you, ma'am. Lovely to have you with us. And from the wider community. Now, the third is to launch our campaigns around the themes of care, employment and training. And the fourth is what we're doing already. We're going to have some fun doing it. The agenda that you have uh, on your seats in front of you is designed to achieve these goals. But we can't do it without your participation and discipline. So I ask everyone to endorse our agenda by holding them up in the air. Now, I ask you, do you endorse this agenda? Yeah. Yay! Thank you. Now have a look around you. What a great turnout we have here tonight. Let's make some noise. The Community Alliance has been formed in recognition that when we work together, people have the power to change our community. Now let's make some organised noise. When I say people, you say power. People! Power. People! Power. People! Power. 
We're now going to hear from each of the partner organisations of the Queensland Community Alliance, and we will see the organised strength and diversity of civil society that is gathered in this room tonight. When your organisation's representative is speaking, please stand, or if you can't stand, raise your hand. And if you're happy to be here, you might like to make some more noise as well. Hi, I'm Peter Arndt from the Catholic Archdiocese of Brisbane. We are over 60,000 active Christians in 97 parishes across South East Queensland, worshipping God, celebrating God's love and mercy, deepening our relationship with Jesus Christ and listening to the guidance of the Spirit. We go out from our parish communities to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, to offer service, healing and inclusion, and to care for God's creation. Hi, my name's Neil Henderson. I'm Secretary of the Services Union. We represent 12,000 members working in Queensland local government, government-owned corporations, private industry and the community and disability services sector. All the way over here. I'm Paul Turner, branch president of Amnesty International Queensland. We represent 40,000 Amnesty supporters across the state working to promote human rights. My name is Patricia Ferguson, a warden of Logan Anglican Parish. We have about 200 active members keen to contribute to the community's well-being. My name's Sandra Eels and I'm the Assistant Secretary of the Queensland Nurses and Midwives Union. Tonight, I'm representing more than 58,000 nurses and midwives, members of the QNMU who work across all sectors providing care to the sick and vulnerable. Our nursing and midwifery, as well as our union values, drive all that we do and unite us in our quest for a fairer society for everybody. My name is Anne Curzon and I'm with Churches of Christ in Queensland. We deliver over 300 services in more than 100 communities across Queensland, Victoria and Vanuatu and Ipswich, which is where we've got folk from tonight. Um, we provide Christ-inspired care and compassion to vulnerable people at different stages in their life journey. My name's Terry Burke. I'm the branch secretary of the Independent Education Union, Queensland and Northern Territory branch. Our union represents over 17,000 teachers, trainers, school officers and services staff in the non-government education sector across Queensland and the Northern Territory. We are committed to working with the Alliance. My name is Owen Dugan and I'm the State Secretary of the Rail Tram and Bus Union Queensland Branch. We represent over 7,000 rail and tram workers from across Queensland, along with the Brisbane bus drivers, to promote, pub <laughs> to promote public transport as an essential element in a fair and environmentally sustainable society. Thank you. My name is Roger Marshall. I'm convener of the Logan Community Groups Alliance. Our alliance represents the interests of locally managed and governed community neighbourhood centres in the city of Logan and the thousands of residents who support and participate in their activities each year. My name is Mary Fransman 
and I'm a member of the Presentation Congregation Queensland, a group of a group of 60 Catholic sisters. Our challenge as Queensland Presentation Sisters is to search for God, to stand with those made poor, and work to change the structures that oppress them, and to care for Earth, our home. My name is Jeremy Sang, and I'm the Programs Officer for Edmund Rice Camps Brisbane. We represent over 300 young volunteers who work with over 200 families and children living in disadvantage in South East Queensland. My name is Dan Nancaro from the Mighty Electrical Trades Union. <laughs> the ETU represents more than 13,000 committed and active electrical workers throughout Queensland and the Northern Territory. Good evening, my name is Vivian Dugan and I'm the president of the Together branch of the Australian Services Union. We're a union of 27,000 members working all across Queensland in the Queensland public sector as well as in the private sector. Our union is committed to fairness and justice and improving our members' working lives. My name is Peter Catt. I'm the Dean of St John's Anglican Cathedral, Chair of the uh, Social Responsibilities Committee for the Southern Queensland Anglican Diocese. We're driven by the marks of mission which call on us to overturn unjust structures and to safeguard the integrity of the earth. My name is Terry Fitzpatrick and I'm from the St Mary's in exile community. We represent 500 people who are committed to the pursuit of social justice and respect for our earth. My name is Brendan Crotty. I'm the Deputy General Secretary of the Mighty Queensland Teachers Union. We represent more than 44,500 state school teachers and TAFE teachers across this state and we proudly promote and protect public education. So my name's Sheila Hunter and I'm Assistant Secretary of United Voice Queensland. United Voice represents almost 30,000 members in education, health, aged care, ambulance, contracting, manufacturing, security and hospitality. We empower our mem members to fight for a better life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, meaning peace to everybody. My name is Sayyid Zaheer. I'm representing Islamic Shia Council of Queensland. We, we have over 5,000 members from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. We provide religious, social, and educational service to our community. And it looks like we are the only Muslim organization join the alliance. I'm the Reverend Brian Hull, the Presbytery Minister for Bremer Brisbane Presbytery of the Uniting Church in Australia. We represent 32 congregations and over 2,000 people who want to journey and walk the way of Jesus and want to walk it with you. So join with us as we commit to work together. Uh, my name is Reverend Yvonne McGrusty and I'm the chairperson of Morton Rivers Presbytery, Queensland Synod of the Uniting Church. Yes. I represent 38 congregations, that's about two and a half thousand people, I believe, and we want to work together with our community for the common good. My name's Dave Baker, moderator of the Uniting Church in Queensland, the Queensland Synod. Hey! 
I represent over 200 congregations and 30,000 people who worship every Sunday, seeking the common good for Queenslanders. My name is Michael Clifford. I'm the Assistant General Secretary of the Queensland Council of Unions, and I'm so proud to be here as a representative of all of the unions and all of the fantastic unionists in the room tonight. As, as the peak body, we speak for 360,000 union members across Queensland who work hard every day to improve the lives of working people and create a better, fairer and more just society. Hi, my name is Mitra Hakpas from Multicultural Development Australia. I'm we are here with 270 of our refugee and migrant community leaders. We work, we work across Queensland to promote a welcoming, inclusive, multicultural Queensland and create a better future for all. So, Queensland Community Alliance, this is who we are. And now let's all stand together and celebrate. Let's hear some noise. as well as the 26 member organisations representing 1.66 million people that we just heard from. We also have other individuals and organisations here that are exploring becoming members of the Alliance. And I think after tonight, they'll be pretty keen. So to all of you who join us tonight, we extend our warmest welcome. It is also our pleasure tonight to acknowledge the following invited guests, along with the Premier, uh, who are here tonight. Jim Madden, the member for Ipswich West, Councillor Wayne Went, representing Mayor Andrew Antonelli, Matthew Cox from Logan Together, and the heads of disability and care organisations. Please join with me in thanking all of these people. This is our founding assembly, but it's not our first rodeo. We've been on a journey, adapting this organising to our state and discovering together if it was going to be possible for our disparate organisations to stand as one. Tonight, we can announce that the answer is yes. Working with the guests that I've just mentioned, we have achieved real results. And we've asked three of our leaders to tell us the story of how we've got to here. Hello, I'm Anne Fox. I'm a tenant and advocate for the Church of Christ. I live in Ipswich in Queensland. I became involved with the Alliance because I am sick and tired of not being listened to. In Ipswich, we, the Queensland Community Alliance, decided to work on access to mental health after hearing stories from people who were dropping through the cracks. We approached the hospitals and the doctors and they agreed to work with us. We were granted $270,000 for a collective impact project. Through Churches of Christ, I have been challenged to do things I thought I could never do. I co-chaired an assembly of 100 people with the leading mayoral candidates in Ipswich. We asked them to confirm their commitment to working with us on the Mental Health Collective Impact Project. I think democracy only works if people get involved. We have to hold politicians to account. If I can do it at 70 years of age, surely you can. My name is Michelle Bayard and I'm a delegate for my union together. I'm a mother of four kids and I'm a social worker at the Prince Charles Hospital. I stepped up to be a leader uh, for my union when my boss and my organiser saw something in me that wanted to make a difference. 
I became a part of the Alliance when I found out that um, unions, churches and local organisations were meeting together and listening to community members about the problems they were facing. One of the big things that were really hurting people was the cost of parking at Prince Charles. Families that had cancer and heart disease that were really struggling at the local Catholic Church. We had a meeting with over 200 people and we decided to take action on this issue. We met with hospital management and the management of the car park. We decided together that we could introduce concessional parking at Prince Charles. This began in May of this year. Then in July, the Minister for Health, Cameron Dick, announced a statewide rollout of concessions based on the model that we started at Prince Charles Hospital. Getting together with the other people in the community that cared about the issues, uh, getting training, it just enabled me to be a part of something where we could really make a difference and that's what happened. We were able to change things for patients at Prince Charles Hospital. We were able to help them to access the hospital and that was a great win for them and that's why I'm part of the Alliance. My name is Christine Lapalapa -Lapa and I'm a member of the St Maximilian Colby Catholic Parish. I'm a married, working mother of three and I'm very proud to be a member of the Queensland Community Alliance. I got involved in the Alliance because of the inspiration of my late grandmother who always found time to give back to her community. We started in Logan. Churches, unions and community organisations got together to explore the importance of community organising. In 2014, we listened to stories of pressures that our community were facing and the issues were transport and safety. We started organising and we turned out 300 people and won commitments from our Logan City Council and state government. Every mayoral candidate promised to fund public transport in Logan and Mayor Luke Smith honoured his promise. Minister Jackie Trad announced trials for demand responsive transport and Australian First. Soon after, Minister Cameron Dick announced funding for three maternity hubs in Logan. We have demonstrated that we are a persistent, non-partisan, people power alliance. We're just getting started, but already we've won things that people thought were too hard. Now, we are going to take the next step just imagine what we are going to achieve together. Hey folks, this, relationship, this alliance is built on relationships, on communication, on dialogue between community members. We listen to one another, we work together to find a way to make things better for all in our community. So right now, I'm going to ask you to have a short conversation. You'll have three minutes. And the theme of the conversation I want you to have is share one hope that you have uh, about being a part of the Queensland Community Alliance. Three minutes, share with someone one hope that you have about the Alliance. You have three minutes, so it's over to you. OK, folks, let's uh, move on. It's great you're having these conversations. Please keep them up after our meeting tonight. We have achieved some great things in our story together. In Logan, we've won $150,000 to organise for Logan kids. $2 million this year for three community-based maternity hubs. Council funding for public transport. A state demand responsive transport trial. And an integrated transport plan. Let's hear it for the Logan District. In Ipswich, we won $270,000 in funding and wide support for a collective impact project to improve mental health access. Let's cheer it for Ipswich. <laughs> Ipswich, we also won a farm share resettlement scheme. Yoo-hoo! <laughs> and in Stafford and the surrounding areas, we won expanded parking concessions. Concessions that are now going to be the template for a statewide scheme. So let's call it out for North Ipswich, <laughs> North Brisbane. Okay. Folks, we've achieved many things. We've made a real difference in people's lives. So I want you to welcome Michelle Bird to share Amy's story. Thank you, Michelle. 
I wasn't going to speak tonight, but unfortunately Amy's husband has been hospitalised, so I'm here with her words. My name is Amy. I'm a mum of three boys. I got involved in the Alliance through the struggle to make hospital parking more affordable. A year ago, my fiancé Brett was awaiting a heart transplant and I was pregnant with my youngest when the cost of parking fees became a huge issue for us. I was taking Brett to the Prince Charles a couple of times a week. Brett couldn't work because of his ill health and I was on maternity leave. I'd been in and out of the martyr mothers with a risky pregnancy. At Prince Charles, to save costs, I was walking a kilometre with our four-year-old son and our ten-month-old in a pram. I was heavily pregnant and had placenta previa. I couldn't really walk. Then at 31 weeks, my waters broke. We shared our story and found out so many people couldn't access health of loved ones or loved ones because of the cost of hospital parking. I spoke at the Stafford Assembly of the Alliance, where hospital management promised to work with us for a solution. Our story was in the Courier Mail. Brett had his surgery and it was a success. My son was born healthy and is now eight kilograms. In May, new parking concessions were brought in at the Prince Charles Hospital. Brett's kidneys are in trouble due to the transplant, so we will still visit the hospital regularly. A month ago, inspired by our solution, the state government committed $7.5 million to ensure concessions like Prince Charles are extended statewide. It's hard to believe all this change started with one story. Looking back, that period was so stressful, but it was truly wonderful that at least it led to change for others going through similar situations. Amy would have loved to have been here tonight, but thank you for sharing in her story. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing Amy and Brett's story. It's stories like these that inspire us and call us to take action. And now we move to the business of the night. We will be dealing with two substantive pieces of public business and then asking the Premier to respond uh, to these and to recognise our alliance and commit to working with us. At our discernment in March, 340 leaders discerned two themes as our common areas of action. These are care and employment and training. We firstly turn to care, and I would like to invite Dan Prentice and Anne Kirsten to the podium. Good evening. My name is Dan Prentice, registered nurse and aged care project officer at the Queensland Nurses and Midwives Union. I'm involved because I've worked in both hospitals and aged care. I want to see the same quality of care for older Australians receiving aged care services that we take for granted when we go to hospital. My name is Anne Curzon and I'm the Government Relations and Policy Advisor with Churches of Christ in Queensland. And I'm involved because I've spent years talking to people about how we pay for care, how we deliver care and what happens when we miss the mark. I want to make sure we get the best for people as things change and that we avoid the worst. Dan and I are the co-chairs of this Care Research Action Team you see before you here. We have all come together because aged care, disability and mental health care matter to us. In our alliance, Four of our unions represent the nurses, personal carers, paramedics, allied health and disability workers who provide care in Queensland. We have the churches that started many of the largest aged care and disability services, as well as charities that directly deliver care. But beyond this, we're all someone's child and someone's family member, and we've all had experiences trying to access care ourselves and for the people we love, or we will have to do this in our future. This is why accessible quality care is so important to us. Since March, we've been looking into what's happening across mental health, disability and aged care services as they go through a massive change. Traditionally, governments have given money to organisations to provide services in the community. Governments are now starting to give money to individuals so they can choose and buy services that they need. This is called consumer-directed care. In disability and mental health, this is through the National Disability Insurance Scheme, code name NDIS. In aged care, this is through My Aged Care. 
These are the largest reforms to our social service system since the introduction of Medicare, and it is essential that we do it right the first time, and we hear the voices of people receiving care and their families. We don't want people getting lost in the bureaucracy. The NDIS could be a real opportunity. It nearly doubles the funding available for care, and an estimated one in five of all new jobs in Queensland will be in the care industry. Our team looked at the big picture of care. We looked at everything across age care, disability and mental health. We consulted with a wide range of people and were shocked by people's stories. We heard about failures of care, of grief and of frustration. These stories demonstrated that the rollout of the NDIS is not going smoothly. Many of the people who need it most are missing out on care, planning decisions are inconsistent, and the process of getting a care plan have been unclear and uncertain. In aged care, funding cuts are putting pressure on budgets and workloads, and delays waiting for assessments and care packages have meant that people have not been able to stay in their own home, and in some instances have even died while waiting for appropriate care. So we invite Nigel, Dr Claire, Donna and Chris to share their stories with us now. My name is Nigel Webb, I'm a host provider, coordinator for ICANN Direct and I'm the chairperson of Queenslanders with Disability Network. I want to share a story about an NDIS participant and the challenges that she has faced in getting um, a plan that reflects her choices. She lives in regional Queensland and she was told she could only accept a phone assessment. She requested a face-to-face -face assessment and was denied. She's a professional officer in the Australian Public Service and she was assigned a planner who could not communicate well due to her poor English. As well as having a disability from birth, she, she was recovering from an injury after falling into a bonfire. She has burns to 40% of her body and is wearing a full burn, a burn suit. She is a mum to three kids and if she had the conversation in person with the assessor would have seen this. She planned to have her plan managed by a, a plan manager but it was, was directed to self-manage, which she didn't feel confident to do so. She works full time as well as being a single parent and is paying off a mortgage. I was able to assist her to negotiate the plan she wanted and now she has access to resources that she has never had before. But this could only, this could easily could have not happened. If we are to achieve the goals of the NDIS, participants will need supports to achieve the results that she has, but we will only get there if there is advocacy and planned supports that people need. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Adjunct Associate Professor Claire Townsend, and I'm the National Research and Development Manager for Synapse. Let me tell you a story about a 49-year-old Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander man who is a member of the Stolen Generation and a victim of child abuse. In 2014, Jack had cancer in his arm and as a result has limited use of this arm and chronic pain. He also has significant neurocognitive disability and psychosocial disability. Due to his life experiences, he's reluctant to leave his house and to engage with mainstream services. As a result, he receives little medical support and rehabilitation. Jack required a specialist visit from our team to prepare an NDIS access request form. Under the, un under the NDIS individual model, most organisations who provide culturally safe and effective assessments and supports will not be funded in the future. I find it shocking to report to you tonight that Jack's NDI application was rejected. The NDIA said he had a medical condition requiring state treatment, not a disability that requires NDIS support. Jack is left feeling confused and betrayed by a system he fears. He feels powerless to appeal his decision and surely that's unacceptable that a system meant to deliver choice and control leaves marginalised people feeling less power. 
Jack needs a culturally safe NDIS system that works for him. Jack represents one of hundreds of marginalised people who have been repeatedly failed by human services and are at risk of being left behind again by the NDIS. About trying to get help in Ipswich. I've had some severe mental illness for over 30 years. I was at the, I was at the stage where I was cutting up. Well, I didn't want to cut up anymore. A friend of mine, we went to the Bell Street Plaza, seen my psychiatrist that was there, and he told me, look, and my, my friend at the time, take her up to the Ipswich Hospital. Good evening, I'm Donna Conway from Sacred Heart Catholic Parish in Bavel, and I'm here as friend and supporter of Jules, who many of you may remember from the Ipswich Assembly. Due to Jules' ongoing mental health challenges and the difficulty that goes with, um, and the busyness that goes with raising a child with a mental health issue of her own and a son with an acquired brain injury, none of Jules' family are registered for the NDIS. While the NDIS may work well for some, for families like Jules, they're just falling through the cracks. And that's just not good enough. So our actions tonight need to help close those gaps. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Chris, and I've been a registered nurse for 44 years, working in many areas, including aged care. My mother, Annie, was admitted to a private aged care facility in October 2016, and I would like to share her story. Annie is 86. Um, she's been a fiercely independent lady who loved spending time with her family and friends. After seven emergency admissions to hospital, she was transferred to the aged care facility. I thought um, that there would be sufficient staff to make sure that her basic needs, such as toileting, showering, pressure area care, mobility and her airway, as she has a tracheostomy and has had for 27 years, so she's a neck breather. Um, in reality, she often has to wait up to an hour to be taken to the toilet because she needs two people to assist and support her basic needs and there's simply not enough staff available at the time she needs help. The staff are very apologetic, they feel frustrated, and have stated they will return as soon as they can. At a recent case conference, I raised the issue of my mother not getting the basic care that she needs, and was told that if I was unhappy, I could try to find another aged care facility that would provide one-on-one -on -one care. I'm not asking for one-on-one -on -one care. I just want to see her basic needs met, i.e. airway, toileting, reposition, repositioning, um, attended in a safe, timely, and a dignified manner. My concerns are that there is not enough care staff, and it seems that money is being put before these vulnerable group of people. After hearing stories like these and talking with people working in the field, our Care Research Action Team have come up with the following asks. We believe that by addressing these asks, the state government can play, or still play a role in improving the lives of Queenslanders needing care and those working to provide it. To make sure people can access funding for the care they need, we ask the state government to commit to reducing waiting times for aged care assessment team assessments. Funding advocacy to ensure the voice of people with a disability is heard through these changes and enacting a Queensland Human Rights Act to protect people's rights. To make sure people get workers they can trust with the right skills, we ask the state government to establish a training fund for workers delivering consumer-directed care, ensure funding for the NDIS workability project in the final year of the NDIS rollout, start a new workability project on aged care, develop an induction and registration process for all workers delivering consumer-directed care and ensure any state-run residential aged care facilities have research-based staffing levels. To make, sure, to make sure people have the support when things go wrong, we ask the state government to establish a Queensland Disability Commission 
and expand the Queensland Health Ombudsman to work with Aged Care Complaints Commissioner to investigate aged care issues. Before the election, we will be seeking concrete commitments and timeframes from both the government and opposition to our tasks. We would ask the Premier to meet with us within six months after the election to confirm timelines, funding and other critical elements. Thank you. Thank you to our care team. We will now move on to our second focus area for tonight, employment and training. To talk to us about this, please welcome Mel Sutton. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the drums. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mel Sutton, and I am an organiser with United Voice. I have been fortunate enough to be a co-chair for our Employment and Training Research Action Team, along with Kelly Sabanda from MDA, Jess Leeming from the Logan Community Groups Alliance, and David Tredores from Queensland Teachers Union. Can I please ask that you all come together and welcome not just our chairs, but our whole research action team. Together we have heard endless stories about people over our 26 member organisations being exploited at work, struggling to find work, or facing poor quality training that doesn't lead to any work. Since March, we have met with academics, interested organisations, and many other experts. We have also done further listening from our members. Tonight we will hear some of these stories and the proposals that we pro to address these problems. We will start with tra um, training, and I would like to invite Sarah up to share her experience of training. My name is Sarah Lovell. Working in early education with children and babies has always been my dream job. I started studying my Diploma of Early Childhood Education and Care with SAGE a couple of years ago. I got through 80% of the course, but I had six different trainers, which made it studying difficult. I loved working with children. Then they stopped contacting me and suddenly shut down and disappeared. They won't even send me my booklets or documents to show that I was competent for all my units. I've been waiting more than two years. I lost my job in early education because I can't give the centre my units of competency. Basically, that means I wasted more than a year full-time study, I lost my job, and I'm left with over $19,000 debt. Please help me fix this and stop it from happening again. Good evening, my name is Gary Innes. I've been a vocational trainer for 15 years. I recently worked for a uh, training organisation that is now in liquidation. I'm here representing the many trainers in vocational education who are overworked, underpaid and isolated and are suffering from mental, physical and emotional distress. I know of thousands of students who are enrolled in inappropriate education courses. I know of students who are now saddled with thousands and thousands of dollars of debt, and they shouldn't have been. We need change in this industry, but we need the right kind of change. But please, don't put more pressure on the trainers, because in many, in many cases, we're the ones holding VET together. Thank you. My name is Martin Ram. I'm a director of a aged care company. Recently, we hired a staff by the name of Janice for the role to fill of an AIN. Janice had the qualification as said three, manual handling, qualification, medication, and also with 120 hours of placement. And she suited the role which we advertised. On the first day of the role as an AIN, she froze to a simple task of putting on a pressure socks, a bed sponge for a client of ours. This is not an isolated incident. This happens across the board. With my conversation with other directors in the same industry, 
I hear it over and over again. This is purely the consequences of poor training. I would like to work with QCA and I want to challenge and change the training the workers get so that they have and are well prepared and confident to perform the job they've been hired for. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Noor. I'm from Sudan. Three years ago, I was uh, arrived in Australia seeking asylum. Uh, now I'm in chef visa, which is temporary protection visa, uh, five years visa. Uh, when I was at home, I graduated from uni. I work as electrical engineer. Uh, but here, I can't use that qualification here in Australia. Uh, I applied many times for, uh, for course. Uh, I applied TAFE uh, to do some courses, but unfortunately, all my applications were rejected. Um, uh, because my visa status is not, uh, I'm not eligible for any funding from government. Um, they asked me to pay $25,000, which is I can't afford uh, as international student. Uh, I wish that if uh, there is any opportunity for someone or people who are like my situation, and thank you so much. I'm Sheree Wills. I have a background in training and am now a growth organiser at the IEU. I have seen firsthand the best and the worst this sector has to offer. As we have just heard from Sarah, Gary, Martin and Nur, these stories represent thousands of Queenslanders who have been terribly affected by the extreme push for corporatisation and profit-focused education in our VET sector. The Research Action Team for Training and Employment have listened to these issues and identified solutions to rebuild a stable and viable VET sector here in Queensland. Firstly, funding needs to be restored to 2016-17 levels then continue to grow and should not be lost to corporate greed or federal government inaction. It is, <laughs> it is vital the funds make it to the trainer in the classroom. It is essential the student experience and skills-based competency are top priority. We need to strengthen the quality in training outcomes by increasing the average funding per annual hour of contact and only funding providers pr delivering a minimum of 60% contact time with students. By introducing voluntary VET educator accreditation at, with, with QCOT and establishing a centre of excellence with that continual support and development, we will ensure the fundamentals at ground level are addressed and continuously built upon. We believe everyone here has the right to an education. How can we deny such a right in a country as developed as Australia? We must ensure that people seeking asylum, people like Nur, have the opportunity of affordable training to develop their skills and benefit their whole community. <laughs> Lastly, we seek a commitment to ensure the training system recognises, supports and develops the skills that new Queenslanders bring with them from overseas. We have identified that this system is in pieces. It is broken. This affects every single one of us here. We must build a quality training sector that will lay solid pathways to employment. With the 1,400 or more people here tonight, I have hope we can do this. Thank you, Sherry. Um, we are now going to be joined by Sergio and Kenny, who are going to be sharing their stories um, from their experiences within employment. My name is Sergio. I'm from Colombia, and I'm part of the Latin American Catholic community. I want to tell you some stories from the place I used to work in Brisbane. Stories about not getting my pay slips, working 12 hours and only getting paid for three. 
histories about being employer under ABM and getting paid only $15 instead of $30. The worst part was when I worked in a hotel and my boss stole $10,000 from me and my five colleagues because he didn't pay us. So we contact Fair Work and they say, you had to pay to go to the small claims court. But we say, how can we pay? We are an international student and we don't have enough money to pay for the court. You may think this situation only happened once, but for me and my community, it's happening every day. We need your help to resolve this situation. This is about human dignity. Malo Elele and greetings to you, Madam Premier from the Kingdom of Tonga. My name is Kenny, aka the Tongan Robin Hood. <laughs> My wife's relative, Vaka, was a seasonal farm worker in Childers. When we heard he was in hospital here in Brisbane, we went to visit him. We discovered that he was in an induced coma and the doctors advised us that they couldn't bring him out of it. I was in total shock when I was told that he had been sick for eight days before anyone took him to the doctor. He was weak to work, and on day number five, he started vomiting blood. The moment when the doctor said that we had to turn off the life support was too much for me to handle. I had lost my son to cancer, and I couldn't be there to watch poor Vaka die. During this very difficult time, I turned to Reverend Maile Molitika from the Uniting Church's Tongan Congregation in Highgate Hill for the much needed pastoral care. My wife Sandra and I took Vaka back home to Tonga for the proper funeral, and I decided that I won't let his death be in vain. I'm here tonight because we have to stop the mistreatment and exploitation of vulnerable seasonal workers. Vaca came on a government approved placement and 10 seasonal workers have died in the past five years. There must be some duty of care on government to prevent this abuse and to ultimately save the lives of our seasonal workers. Madam Premier, if I may introduce the Reverend Maile Molitika. If I can ask Maile to be upstanding, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a servant of the Lord, and he has single-handedly been the backbone of the Tongan community. Thank you, one. Thank you all. So tonight we have heard these incredibly powerful stories from Sergio and Kenny. These are the stories, along with many others like them, that have guided the work of our research action team. What we know is that many of the stories we have heard are about situations where rights do exist. Rights exist, regulations exist, but the outcomes for Sergio, Kenny, and many others still have not improved. We therefore have focused our first solution on inspectors and compliance. While most employment enforcement is federal, the state still has a duty to fight for Queensland workers. The state still has powers relating to workplace health and safety and work cover inspectors. Our proposal is for the state government to use these powers creatively and to increase the numbers of inspectors enforcing compliance and actively documenting any exploitation so that that can be reported to the Fair Work Ombudsman. These inspectors would be targeted in our most vulnerable industries, such as contract cleaning, seasonal farm work, and hospitality. More inspectors means less exploitation and a fair playing field for employers.
Our second main proposal is for a state government-led apprenticeship program. We have heard stories of young people not finding jobs that fulfil their training, even when qualified. This would be a direct commitment from state government to utilise their own employment and market power to ensure quality jobs. As the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the, in the Australian Industry Group and the Business Council of Australia have all agreed apprenticeships is the area of reform where government will get maximum return for their investment and provide the greatest opportunities for young people and Australian workers. Finally, all our stories tonight show that training and employment have to work as an interrelated system. We are asking the Queensland Government to partner with our alliance to ensure training remains an effective vehicle for skill development and an important pathway for sustainable employment. As our economy transforms and is disrupted, civil society should have a voice at that table. Our member organisations have to step up to build these relationships that play this role, but we need this role to be recognised by government. You have heard from us about employment, about training, and about the way they affect each other. Tonight is the beginning of us acting publicly together on these issues. We invite you all to be leaders who, who, to drive this employment and training campaign. As with the care team, we will be seeking concrete commitments of timeframes from both the government and the opposition in the lead up to the state election. We too would ask the Premier to meet with us after the election within six months to confirm timelines, funding and other crucial elements. Thank you. Queensland Community Alliance, please join with me in inviting the Premier, Anastasia Palaszczuk, to the stage. Premier, welcome. Tonight, we have four questions for you, and we'll ask them all at once, and then we'll give you time to respond. The first question is, will you commit a government you lead to recognise our alliance as organised civil society? Second question is, you've heard these powerful stories tonight about care. Will your government improve the quality and the delivery of care for the elderly? for people with disabilities and those living with mental illnesses. Will you work with us, the Queensland Community Alliance, to deliver our proposed solutions? Our third question is, um, you've heard the stories um, about training and employment. Will your government ensure continued funding for quality training that provides real skills and leads to good jobs? Will you work with us to implement solutions to expose and investigate exploitation of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged workers in Queensland. And finally, Premier, if returned as Premier, will you commit to personally meet with a delegation of our Alliance leaders annually and attend an assembly like this before the subsequent election? Thank you and good evening, co-chairs of Founding Assembly of the Queensland Community Alliance, representatives from faith organisations, unions, community groups and ethnic associations. Ladies and gentlemen, to the co-chairs, thank you for the invitation to be here today at this historic event. This is an unprecedented gathering of such a diverse group of dedicated community workers and their representatives. And on behalf of all Queenslanders, please accept my thanks for your service and your dedication to the state. Firstly, from the outset, I do recognise the Alliance as organised civil society and I regard you as a partner in restoring hope and opportunity across all of Queensland. <laughs> the work to forge this alliance started in many dark days more than four years ago, when thousands of Queenslanders, many for the first time, took to the streets to defend our basic services and stand up for people's rights. My commitment to Queensland then and since is for a Queensland of progress, not protest. 
A Queensland where we pull together, not apart. And a Queensland that is united and not divided. Your work in our communities every day and in times of need, such as during natural disasters like Tropical Cyclone Debbie, strengthens the fabric of our society. Secondly, my government is determined to ensure Queenslanders, no matter their age or their postcode, can access quality health services no matter where they live across our state. To date, we have employed an extra 3,170 nurses, 1,190 doctors, 250 ambulance officers for frontline services. We have made landmark decisions. We mandated in law a minimum number of nurses to patients in our public sector health facilities. For the sick, it means better care in our hospitals and for our nurses, there'll be more manageable and safer workloads. In relation to mental health issues, I know this is a big issue for many, many people. When the former government closed the Barrett Healthcare Centre for young children with mental and complex health issues, my government has made a commitment to rebuild and we are rebuilding a new centre. We are also increasing consumer protections for Queensland seniors in retirement with new laws to cover retirement villages and manufactured homes. I know the stress that this is creating on families across our state. My grandfather, my grandmother herself recently went into a nursing home. The complex paperwork is putting families under stress and we need to make sure that we work on that. Thirdly, my government is determined to ensure Queenslanders are ready for the work and the jobs that, that they are ready for them. And since the last election, 94,500 Queenslanders have got jobs. However, we've also restored skilling Queenslanders for work, and I'm pleased to say that 9,000 Queenslanders are now in jobs as part of that program, and 14,000 more will complete it. My government is committed to an affordable and accessible high quality training sector and that means strengthening TAFE. And on teaching, <laughs> and on education and training, I must declare a bias. My father was a teacher and I have two sisters who are teachers. Teaching is the only profession that creates all professions and we must never stop learning. We've employed 3,095 teachers and teacher aides. And finally, for as long as I have the privilege to be Premier of Queensland, my door and that of my ministers will always be open. At the last election, Queenslanders put their trust in me. Every day I value that trust. Let me tell you one thing my father said to me. When someone walks through that door, you listen to them because they have a story to be told and a story to listen to. It is your duty and it is your role to listen and, and make good and help those people. And through no fault of their own people, sometimes are vulnerable in our society and they fall through the cracks and it is government's duty to deliver the services for people to help them in those times, to get back on their feet. And that is my commitment. And finally, the last one is, people's personal stories have a great impression on me. Everywhere I travel across the state, I listen. I listen and I take the time to listen. Because every single community in our state has different issues and there's not a one shoe that fits all. We need to listen to communities and we need to deliver to communities. And I give you my solemn commitment tonight that I will meet, continue to meet with you as Premier, continue to work with you because we work best when we work together and I will always put Queenslanders first. Thank you, Premier. Um, Just to summarise, Premier, what I heard was that's a yes to recognition. Yes. A yes to our care asks, a yes to employment, and a yes to meeting with us. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you.
So tonight we've heard some strong commitments from the Premier and I'd like to again thank Premier Palaszczuk. One of the things working with... Um, <laughs> working with people from um, culturally diverse communities has taught me about gratitude. And so I think it's important in this moment for us to show our gratitude and let us let the people who are not in the room know what has happened here tonight. So Alliance, get out your phones. Um, the Queensland Community Alliance has just posted on Facebook a post. So what I need you to do is jump on your phones, jump onto Facebook and click on the Queensland Community Alliance. Share our post, like it and comment. And as soon as you've done that, show me your torch. We're going to let you keep doing that because we're running a little bit against time. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Dave. Yeah. Folks, uh, you might notice uh, that tonight we don't have uh, Mr Tim Nichols uh, with us. In uh, late June, in mid-June, we wrote to the opposition leader, Mr Nichols, and invited him uh, to come tonight. In July, he said he had a prior commitment in Northern Queensland. We provided him with the same asks that we just put to the Premier. He has not provided a video or a representative tonight. We are still negotiating for a commitment for a meeting with the opposition leader. The point of this alliance and of this founding assembly is that we claim our place in public life and we defend, we define ourselves as a group rather than letting others define us. The unions, faith organisations and community groups in this alliance have made pledges to each other to organise together around shared values for the common good. We have turned out our people. We have funded this work together. We've not taken government funding. We've stood in solidarity with each other and maintained a rigorous non-partisan approach. Over the last three years, we have honoured these promises to each other. Through our work, through ordinary leaders giving up their nights and weekends in meetings and one-on-one -on -one conversations. Through listening to the stories of our community, we have earned the right to demand all sides of politics recognise us. The status quo isn't good enough. Satisfaction in democracy has halved since 2007, from 86% to 42%. Queenslanders want a new way for all our politicians to listen to the issues that are important to us. To achieve this, together, here at the Com Queensland Community Alliance, we are building persistent, non-partisan people power. We are not going to take the lack of opposition representative, here tonight, opposition representative here tonight as the final word. The, the Premier has committed on behalf of the government. So from now until the election, we will work to ask for commitments from the opposition candidates and MPs to recognise us and to work with us. So, Queensland Community Alliance. Are we committed to this alliance being non-partisan? Yeah. Yes! Are we committed to people power? Amen. So let's take the first step tonight. Let's let the opposition leader know. We have just posted on the Queensland Community Alliance site a message to Tim Nichols. So do it again. Grab out your phones and jump on our Facebook um, site. Like, share and comment. So our Facebook post says, Tim Nichols, we commit that our alliance will be non-partisan people power. We expect you to recognise this and if elected into government to work with us to address the stories we've shared. 
Hold up your phones when it's done. And if you haven't had time to, right now, do it as soon as we've finished. <laughs> we've heard from the Premier and she's indicated what she's prepared to do. You were given a commitment card when you came in tonight. Please take it out. Our power as an organised civil society comes from our ability to take action and the promises we make to each other. So now I call on you to commit to action. If you are going to sign up to be a part of the campaign to improve care in Queensland, please wave your card in the air. If you are going to sign up to be a part of the campaign for better employment and training in Queensland, wave your card in the air. If you are interested in stepping up within your organisation and would like to undertake training in leadership and community organising through the two-day foundations of community organising training or for being considered for national training, please mark your card and wave that now. If you are going to take action to ensure that your Member of Parliament after the election recognises this alliance and works with us, with us on these issues of care and employment, please wave your card. Folks, you've made your individual commitments and now for our final business tonight, it is for our organisations to publicly commit to the Alliance and to these campaigns. So I invite our leaders to come forward. The Catholic Archdiocese of Brisbane has been associated with the Alliance from the early years and in the present and commits to finding ways to support those parishes uh, wanting to be active in the Alliance, especially in the campaigns on care and training and employment. The Services Union is proud to be committed to the Queensland Community Alliance and to continue that commitment for the coming three years. Our investment in the Alliance is $10,000 per year. Amnesty International Queensland is proud to commit to the Queensland Community Alliance for the coming 12 months. Our investment in the Alliance is $3,000, 10% of our state organising budget. We commit to work on the education, training and care campaigns. Our commitment as the Anglican Parish of Logan is $1,000 a year for the next three years. The Queensland Nurses and Midwives Union is committed to continuing to provide $12,000 a year and to building a stronger alliance by encouraging participation of our members in its activities in local communities. Churches of Christ, Churches of Christ in Queensland is proud to be committed to the Queensland Community Alliance for the next three years. We commit to working on the care campaign and supporting our community members to participate at a local level. The Independent Education Union, Queensland and Northern Territory branch, has been and remains committed to the Community Alliance, and we will con continue our commitment of $10,000 per year for each of the next three years. The RTBU Queensland branch is proud, to, uh, is proud to be committed to the Queensland Community Alliance for the coming three years. Our investment uh, in the Alliance over that period will be $24,000. We commit to work on the training and employment and the care campaigns. The Logan Community Group Alliance is proud to be committed to the Queensland Community Alliance for at least the next two years with a financial contribution of at least $2,500 per year. <laughs> The Queensland Presentation Sisters are committed to the Queensland Community Alliance for three years and have committed $20,000 a year, as well as periodic donations to support particular projects.
Edmund Rice Camps Brisbane is proud to be a part of the collective action of the Queensland Community Alliance and we're excited to be a part of the future that this alliance has. Yeah, good on you. The Electrical Trades Union is committed to $10,000 per year to the Queensland Community Alliance. Together commits $12,000 a year for the next three years and to being involved in both campaigns. The Social Responsibilities Committee of the Southern Queensland Anglican Diocese is committed to the Alliance for the next three years and we commit $3,000 per year and will support both campaigns. The St Mary's and Exile community is proud to be committed to the Queensland Alliance for the next two years and our investment in the Alliance is $2,000 a year. The Queensland Teachers Union is proud to be committed to the Queensland Community Alliance and for the coming three years, our investment in the Alliance will be $12,000 per year. United we, commit, we commit to work on both the employment, training and care campaigns with everyone else. United Voice is committed to the Queensland Community Alliance and will give $12,000 a year for the next three years. Islamic Shia Council of Queensland is proud to be committed to the Queensland Community Alliance and our investment in the Alliance is $3,000 for the coming three years. Morton Rivers Presbytery of the Uniting Church is recommitting to the Queensland Community Alliance for the next three years because we believe together we can make a difference. The Bremer Brisbane Presbytery of the Uniting Church is proud to be committed to the Queensland Community Alliance. Our investment and commitment is $2,000 over the coming three years and we commit to work on education and training and the care campaigns. The Uniting Church Synod is proud to be committed to the Queensland Community Alliance for the coming three years. Our investment in the Alliance will be $15,000 per year and we commit to work on care, education and training campaigns. Come on, the, the Queensland Council of Unions is proud to be committed to the Queensland Community Alliance. Our investment in the Alliance for the coming year will be $60,000. And we, and we commit to work with our alliance partners on projects that strive for the common good. Multicultural Development Australia is committed to the Queensland, uh, Co Queensland Community Alliance for the next three years. Our commitment is $15,000 a year. Yeah. Alongside, alongside of our community leaders in Brisbane and across Queensland, we commit to work on the campaigns of employment training and care. So Queensland Community Alliance, tonight we wanted to get recognition, to launch our campaigns and to found our alliance. And we have been recognised. We have launched our campaigns and now, with the commitments of our partner organisations, we have founded. Stand up and congratulate each other! So folks, folks, we've reached uh, the end of our founding assembly. Martin Luther King Jr. once said about church, the same, this thing, he's, our, our, our alliance assemblies aren't something you come to, they are something you go from. And tonight we are going to go from here singing. I ask our choir of choirs to return, they're up here and to lead us in the song that you have on your agenda sheet. The people have the power. I now declare our founding assembly closed. Yeah.